Any great cause must be won on many fronts. Take World War II. That was a great cause that our country partook in. And the people right out in the front of that, of course, were the soldiers fighting, digging the trenches, going into enemy territory, risking their lives. But they're not the only ones. There were the medics and the nurses. There were the people running the supply lines. There were the people back, you know, in Washington and wherever else that were planning the strategy. Uh, there was Rosie the Riveter and the factory and the farmers producing the food and the people buying the war bonds. It takes the whole group. It's like that with any great cause. Now, we as Christians are engaged in a great cause as well. It's not a war that's fought with guns or swords or missiles, but it is the greatest cause there is. It's the one that Jesus left us with. We heard about this one a few weeks back when Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Make disciples of all nations. Go and teach the gospel to all creation. That's the most important thing there is. And just like in a war where everybody needs to be involved for it to be successful, well, it's the same here. We are all engaged in this cause. Not everybody's out there on the front lines, as it were, preaching the gospel in other countries, but all of us in our congregations are partaking in this work for the cause of the spread of the gospel. And so I want to begin by looking at a passage from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know, in the Old Testament, the priests were a special class. The nation of Israel itself was a special nation. That's what Peter is referencing here. He's quoting two sections from the Old Testament. One of them is from Deuteronomy, where God told the people that they were his holy nation. He had chosen them out of all the nations on the earth to be his own. But then within the nation of Israel, he had also chosen the tribe of Levi to be priests, to serve him in the temple. And in the Old Testament times, what that meant was that they would go into the temple and they would bring the sacrifices, they would kill the animals, they would sprinkle the blood on the people, they would bring it to the altar, and they would pray for the people, they would teach the people, all these sorts of things. Is that what it means to be a priest now? Well, of course not. We don't have a temple anymore. And Jesus doesn't tell us to build one. He doesn't tell us to go to Jerusalem and make a temple. And he doesn't tell us to bring animals into church and slaughter them or anything of the kind. No, that's because Jesus has become the once for all sacrifice. And that's something that the writer to the Hebrews points out to us. This is in uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 14. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of his creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons, persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more would the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, Purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Notice Jesus has come as the great high priest who, by means of his own blood, has gone into the true holy of holies, into the presence of God, and has sanctified us. He's brought us there into God's presence. And as a result, it says that we now serve God with a clear conscience. Because Jesus' blood has washed us free from that evil conscience, and he's brought us into the very presence of God so that we serve God as priests. Now, add to this what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, where he says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God? And you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Think about that. If your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, then it means that the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And if the Holy Spirit dwells in you, and that your, temp that your body is the temple of God, then anywhere you go, you are serving as a priest, right? The priest, they needed to go into the temple and go into the holy place, and the high priest into the holy of holy place. But you do this every day. Everywhere you go, and in anything 
that you do. We stand throughout our lives now in the very presence of God by the grace and blood of Jesus Christ. And we serve him in all the things that he has given us to do. Think about what holy awe and joy this should give to our daily labors. You're, you're going to work. You're driving your kids to school. You're reading a story to them, having devotion with them, talking to a friend or a neighbor, and all of these things. Picture yourself doing it there in the temple in the presence of God, because that's what, ha- what is happening. Now, our passage that we started with, 1 Peter 2, tells us what the goal of all of this is what it means ultimately that we are serving as priests, says that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He has taken us out of darkness of sin, taken away all of our sins through his blood and brought us to be his very own, brought us into his own kingdom, into his marvelous light. And he's sent us out as priests in everything that we do for the purpose of proclaiming this to everyone. So how do we do that? Well, simply put, in everything. That's what we've been going over these passages for, right? If you're a priest of God as a believer, and if being a priest means that everywhere you go and everything you do and everything you say, you're you're doing that in service to God, as if you were in the temple, then everything you do and everywhere you go and everything you say is done in order to proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. There's this phrase I've heard before, Um, Preach the gospel at all times, use words when necessary, and I don't much care for the phrase because it seems to imply that just by your good works, you can bring people to believe in Jesus, and that's not really quite accurate. Only the preaching of the word can bring people to believe in Jesus, but what that phrase maybe could be understood to mean if we wanted to understand it in, in a proper way is that in everything we do, There's a sense in which we are preaching the gospel as priests and as members of the body of Christ. And I want to go into that a little bit more with our next passage from Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Notice what he says, your fellowship in the gospel. We hear that word fellowship and and perhaps we automatically think about, you know, how we have to separate from false teachers. But here we want to think about it in terms of what the fellowship that we have with like-minded believers really means. And part of what that means is that we join together in this work of the church. Paul is talking to these dear Christians in Philippi, and he is thanking them for the ways that they had supported him in his work. They had sent him offerings so that he could go and preach the gospel in other places. And he's saying that this is a fellowship in the gospel, that when they do that, they're partaking with him in the preaching of the gospel. Now, this fits in with what happens in Acts chapter 2. In Acts 2, you have uh, Peter preach his sermon on Pentecost, and a whole bunch of people are baptized and believe. And afterwards, we have this wonderful description. It says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. They were going around teaching, but it was the apostles that were mostly doing the teaching, and the other people were supporting them in various ways and joining together in fellowship and all these things. And one of the parts of this that he doesn't necessarily get into there, but Paul talks about here, is that idea that your offerings, which are used to support the preaching of the gospel, are a fellowship in the gospel. It's kind of like that hymn. You can be like faithful Aaron, holding up the prophet's hands. Remember that story from the Old Testament? The children of Israel were fighting against an an enemy. And God told Moses to go up on this cliff overlooking the battle and, and raise up his hands. And as long as he held up his hands in blessing, the children of Israel would win. But if he put them down, they'd start to lose. And it was a clear sign to the children of Israel, right, that the battle was not theirs but the Lord's, that he was the strength. It was his blessing that would give them the victory. But Moses, his arms started to get a little tired. I mean, how long have you ever tried to hold up your arms like this? How long can you do it? 
So his brother Aaron and another helper came and held his arms on either side, holding them up so that they could be raised up over the battlefield for longer and longer, and the children of Israel would be blessed and would gain this victory. And that's what that hymn verse is referring to. You know, Moses was the one that God had told to raise up his hands, but Aaron was there holding up those arms for him because he couldn't do it himself. It's the same way with pastors, with teachers here, with missionaries in other countries, with our brothers and sisters in those countries, with the pastors over in these other countries. You know, they're out there preaching the word, but in various ways, we as the body of Christ, we in our congregations are called to hold up their arms, as it were, to have this participation, this fellowship in the gospel. And of course, one of the main ways that we do that is with our offerings, just like it was with the Philippians. We give our offerings at our local congregation or to the mission fund or, you know, to adopt an, inf- uh, sorry, adopt a um, orphan or a seminary student through Project Kinship. And in all of those ways, we're helping to do this. We have this fellowship in the gospel. I mean, think about how, what happens when you do that through Project Kinship with a seminary student, for instance, and then they go on to be a pastor. Who knows how many people that person will preach the gospel to, or, or an orphan that grows up in the Christian faith. How many people will that person preach the gospel to because they were raised in that Christian faith and you help that through your offerings? That's this fellowship in the gospel that Paul's talking about. And in order to have the money, in order to do that, we, of course, need to have jobs. That's how God generally provides for our daily bread and so that we have something to give to him who has need. The Philippians are a good example of that too. One of the members of that congregation was a girl named Lydia. I should say a a woman, a lady named Lydia. She was a business owner, a seller of purple dyes. And she was a big part of the way that they could support Paul. So we too, in all of our work, we should remember this. When when you're at work doing something that seems boring or mind-numbing or whatever, Remember that you are serving as a priest of God. Remember that you're standing in his very presence, cleansed and redeemed through Jesus Christ. Remember that part of the reason you're doing that as a member of the body of Christ is to support the work of preaching the gospel everywhere. And then remember that too in everything that you do, not just in in your offerings, but also in the way that you do everything that you do to show love do good works, to show Christ's love to other people, good works that are motivated by Christ's love for us, and to tell other people about the gospel as you have opportunity as well, and then to pray. You know, we we get that list. Um, Maybe your pastor prints it out, or maybe he doesn't. You could ask him, Uh, but uh, Missionary Olin sends out a list. I think it's every month with, you know, mission opportunities prayer list, different things that are going on in, in other countries and different needs and different situations. And that, that's a great thing to keep around. Keep it on your desk. Keep it on your fridge. Keep it you know, with your devotional materials to, materials to remember to pray about those things and those other lands. Because, you know, God promises you that the prayer of a righteous person does much. It's effective. That's what he says in James. And you are righteous people. You're the priests of God. You know, in the Old Testament, when the children of Israel, they wanted to pray about something, one of the things they would do is come and you know, they would ask that priest, can you pray for me? They had this image, right, of having somebody who was a go-between, of a mediator, like God's there in the Holy of Holies, and I can't go in there because of his holiness and because of my unholiness, so I'll go to the priest, and the priest, he'll go in there and he'll mediate for me to God. And that was all a picture of Jesus. Paul tells us that there is now one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, that we can go right to him. We don't need any intermediaries at all. We are righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. We are holy. We stand in his presence. We have God's ear. We can pray right to him about all of these things. And it's effective. He hears us. And he wants us to pray about these things. Take, for instance, the Lord's Prayer. You know, when you pray the Lord's Prayer, one of the great things about that prayer is the confidence that we can have. You know, Jesus told us, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. And what he means by in my name is according to what he has promised and because of what he has done. The Lord's Prayer is a perfect example. We begin calling God our Father, and he's our Father through Jesus Christ. And all the things that we're asking for, we know that he has promised to give because he told us to pray for them. And what do you 
think it means when we pray, your kingdom come, but that his word would be preached, that people would be brought to faith, both here and in other lands throughout the world, that his powerful word would grow and conquer and spread, that his kingdom would spread from sea to sea and shore to shore and heart to heart, that he would bring people out of the dark domain of Satan into his own marvelous light. And we can have this fellowship in that with all those who preach the gospel, especially those in our own synod, through our offerings and through our prayers, and through our encouragement for them when we see them to hold up the prophet's hands. That brings us to kind of the last thing I want to look at, the last passage, I mean. It's from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in you all. Look at all the oneness here. One call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father. We are many, but he is one and he makes us one with him. This oneness is called the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And notice it's based entirely upon the work and word of Jesus Christ. Paul spoke about this in Ephesians 2, about how Christ has made peace through the blood of his cross. He's made us both one with him and one with one another. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, he calls his disciples to be peacemakers and thus to be sons of the Father, who himself is a peacemaker, to bring his peace into the world in the way that we act and live, and especially in the gospel that we preach, to proclaim that peace of the forgiveness of sins. He's telling us that we can make peace between other people and God by telling them about that peace that is theirs in Christ. That we can then have this peace, let this peace rule in our hearts and rule in our midst in the unity that we have with one another. And that's really the point I want to, to get to here. This unity of peace that we have in our congregation, in our synod, it is what gives us the foundation to preach the gospel together. Our unity in Christ is essential in our work of preaching Christ. It, it's like anything. You know, with people you work with, if you trust them, if you like them, if you're united with them in the same goal and vision, then things are going to work a lot better. Take a basketball team running a, a certain play. Each player has a role. And when each player carries out that role and this guy's in the right place and this guy's in the right place and this guy does the right thing, and they all have that same purpose of scoring the basket, winning the game, the play works. They play as one and they succeed. But if one guy or another guy or all the guys on the team instead are playing for themselves and for their own glory, and if somebody decides, well, I want to be the one that takes the shot, not, not him, why does he get to do it? Then the whole play falls apart. A team has to play as one. The church also must work as one. That's indispensable to our work of preaching the gospel. And you know, there are some people who use the call to preach the gospel, to mission work, as an excuse for ignoring proper doctrine. They think that a focus on true unity of doctrine detracts and distracts from mission work. And they are so wrong. We heard it in our study on the Great Commission. What did Jesus say? Make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. All the things! All of his word. Real unity is not a thing that we can accomplish either. Remember, we, we said before, it's the unity of the spirit. And this, in the same way that making disciples is not a thing that we can accomplish. I, I had this come up in Bible study once. Somebody said, I'm not sure if I like this translation where it says make disciples because we can't do that. And they were coming from a good place. But I pointed out, nevertheless, that's what the word means. That's what Jesus tells us to do. And if you think about that for a second, you might think, well, Jesus, what are you asking of me? How am I supposed to make disciples? But as we saw in that study that Pastor Tiefel did, he gives us the means. He gives us his word and sacraments. He's the one doing it. He just tells us to use those means and, and leave the rest up to him. And the same thing is true of this unity 
This unity that we so desperately need, unity with God and unity with one another to do this work is something that only he creates. In the same way that we cannot save ourselves or pay off a single sin with any work that we do, all of these things are accomplished only by our saving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is the death of Christ that is the sacrifice for all of our sins. And his life is the only source of forgiveness and peace for all people. It's eternally sufficient. It's the only foundation for the church, the singular reason for our unity and the pure power of our confession. It's also that only hope towards which we strive, that sure hope. It's everything. As Paul wrote in Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation. This is the same Paul who went on to spend the next 16 chapters teaching us in detail what that gospel is and what it means for our lives, and then calling in Romans 16 for us to avoid those who move away from the teaching, the pure teaching, in even the smallest way. And what we should get from this is that an insistence on doctrinal unity in our congregations and in our synod does not detract or distract from mission work, but is necessary for mission work. It is the word of God which gives us this unity. It is the word of God which gives us the word to speak. It is this gospel which motivates us to preach the gospel, which motivates us to go into our daily lives uh, and to work and to bring offerings for uh, the congregation and for the mission work at large and overseas. And it's this gospel which motivates us to show love and humility to one another. This all comes from the word. That's the only place where that unity is created and nurtured and kept. That's why Jesus prayed. He said that we might all be one as he and the Father are one. And that's the same prayer we prayed not only for the disciples, but he said for all who will believe in me through their word. He was praying for mission work. And he was praying for unity. And it was all through the word. He said, sanctify them through the truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify them. Make them holy. Set them apart from the world and make them one with you and one with us. One in grace and one in hope and one in the word and one in love. This is so important to remember. You know, at times in our synod, there can be discussions and questions over where the most important place to spend our money is. You know, is it to support our schools here, to support Emmanuel, where we train lay members and teachers and pastors and future missionaries, or is it on the work overseas because there's so many opportunities? And these are discussions, these questions that we are going to have to wrangle with. We need to decide in Christian wisdom, you know, how much to spend on this and how much to spend on that. But as we do so, let's remember to do so with Christian unity and love. Both things are necessary. Both things are wonderful. We need both, and we are one in Christ. We are one in our goal. We need to remember that. In our congregations, too, we'll sometimes have differences of opinion over how best to preach the word in our communities, how best to allocate the resources that we have, what the, the best idea is for doing outreach in the area. But let's start and end those discussions with Jesus. Let them be based on our wonderful unity in Christ. Let sinful motives, sinful bitterness, sinful pride, and all other sinful emotions be drowned and die in our one baptism. When we think, I don't like that, just because it wasn't our idea, let it die in our baptism. When we think, oh, I don't want to do that because I don't want to volunteer for something again, let it die. When we think, I've been doing everything around here and these people need to, they really need to pick it up, let that sinful pride die. And let us lead by example in love, in this love that comes from this unity, in this unity that comes from the word, this word that comes from Jesus in hope, the hope to which we were called, the hope of eternal life, that goal that we have, which is also the goal for our work, to bring that hope to other people, to be one in love, a love which comes from Christ, to be one in understanding and in patience and in steadfastness and strength, eager to maintain our unity, eager to preach Christ to the world. In our prayers, in our work, in our offerings, in our encouragement, in our love, in our unity, all of it in the word of Jesus.